Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Church in Ipswich on this third Sunday of Easter. My name is Mark Allman. I am a professor of theology at Merrimack College and I'm helping cover the pulpit here at First Church while Reverend Rebecca Pugh is on a well-earned sabbatical. My friend Tom Leonard, Reverend Tom Leonard, has also been helping out and you'll be seeing us interchange the pulpit while she's gone. These uh, videos are available through the help of ICAM here at Ipswich as well as on YouTube. As we begin our worship this morning, I invite you to pray with me. Our opening prayer comes from the prophet Jeremiah chapter 29. Thus says the Lord, I will visit you and I will fulfill for you my promise. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. Good and gracious God, open us up to your word this day. Draw close to your people who are suffering and listen to our prayers. Amen. I now invite my son, Zeke Allman, to proclaim God's word for us. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were walking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened uh, here in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some of the women of our group astounded us, They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe that the prophets prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven had their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Zeke. Pray with me, brothers and sisters. Lord, we call upon your Holy Spirit, upon your church, not gathered in our building as normal, but gathered in our homes, our domestic churches. Break open God's word for us. May we, reveal, may we receive God's wisdom 
and message for our, us and our world today. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, welcome to week seven of the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic quarantine, which means that this shelter in place is now officially longer than Lent. As many of you know, I, I work at a college, I work at Merrimack, and when this whole thing started, we did what a lot of colleges and universities did. We canceled all of our classes and we shut down our university on campus, and we moved nearly 5,000 students off campus, and we migrated 1,100 classes to an online format in seven days. It was pretty amazing. It wasn't flawless, but it was pretty amazing. And to help our faculty, we brought in some experts on online education to train them as quickly as we could. And their number one piece of advice to our faculty at the very start was, please don't just start teaching online as if nothing happened. You have to recognize the disruption in your students' lives and in your first few classes, reserve some time for students to talk about how they're coping, about their stress, about everything that they're doing, about their worries. Um, you know, basically check in with your students. And that was their first piece of advice. And as soon as I got this advice, the first thing that popped into my mind was um, the old TV show Friends, which is now reviving itself. Um, there's a character on there called Joey. And Joey is super confident. He's handsome and he's quite the ladies' man. And the joke throughout the series is that he walks up to women and he always says to them, Hey, how you doing? And that's exactly what I thought they were asking us to do. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of creepy. I, I don't think I want to do that. Um, but after a couple of weeks, we started to realize that this checking in, this how you doing, really does really help people, um, helps them process. So I want to do an experiment with you this morning at home. And I, I really ask you to do this. Um, I want to do it right now. I'm not going to ask you how you doing, but I am going to ask you about how you're feeling. So close your eyes. Take a deep breath, center yourself. Think back on this last week. What were the three strongest or most dominant feelings that you had this past week? Okay, so open your eyes. Hey. How you doing? <laughs> okay, I had to do that, in all seriousness, in all seriousness. Um, I did this experiment all week. I'm in a lot of Zoom meetings. I'm in sometimes five or six Zoom meetings in a day. And I started checking in with people on this. I started asking them that question, what's the dominant feeling you've had this week? And here are some of the answers I got from, from coworkers and friends. Emotionally exhausted, wariness, grateful, empathy for those who have lost their jobs, disoriented, Afraid, adrift, empty, trapped, and my favorites, these were my two favorites. Annoyed with people, mostly my family, and happy to be with my family. And the best part is, is the same person said both of those things. And I said to her, I said, wait a minute, you're simultaneously annoyed with your family and happy to be with them? And she looked at me through Zoom and said, it's complicated. <laughs> it is complicated. There's no denying it. Our lives have been completely turned upside down. There's no more planning for the future these days. Pretty much it's all an unknown. Many people, and it's, and it's serious, it's, it's deadly serious, and it's also emotionally serious. Many people have lost their jobs, and with it they've lost their health care. Small business owners are wondering if they will ever reopen again, if all their years of hard work are going to be wiped out by several months of quarantine. Many of those who do have jobs are worried every single day because their job requires them to go out in the public and they're wondering if they're going to come home infected or end up bringing this virus into their home and infect their family. Parents are worried about their children's education. High school seniors are mourning the loss of graduation and prom. College seniors who I work with are now worried if there are going to be any jobs out there at all. And those whose immune systems are compromised or have any underlying medical conditions are honestly and sincerely afraid that they're going to contract this virus and it could have deadly consequences. 
And all of that loss and uncertainty pales in comparison to the daily tragedy that's going on in hospitals and nursing homes today. So much death, so much dying, and so many of our healthcare workers carrying this burden alone because they dare not go home and bring it home to their families. So they are isolated and struggling. I, I joke at the beginning, but we are in a defining moment of our country's history. And the numbers are mind-blowing and staggeringly scary. 1,900 deaths in Massachusetts. 45,000 deaths in the United States. 177,000 deaths worldwide. And those are considered to be conservative estimates. It's in this context that the Easter message of resurrection and hope and new life is so important. This pandemic began in Lent, a time of fasting and repentance, and it has now spanned into the Easter season where despair gives way to hope and death gives way to new life. The readings for the first few weeks of the Easter season, focus almost exclusively on how the disciples responded to finding the tomb open, empty on Easter morning. And the stories come from the day of Easter, later in the day. Last week's gospel, we found the disciples locked behind a closed door, afraid of the crowds, and Jesus comes to their midst and says, Peace, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And in last week's sermon, we explored how their situation is similar to ours, locked behind a closed door and afraid, hiding. And I mentioned how psychologists say that there are three dominant responses to, to a, a, a difficult situation, fight, flight, or paralysis. And last week, we saw the paralysis response. The disciples hide. They hide behind their closed door. This week, we get another version of that response. We get the, the, the flight, the runaway response. Like last week, this story today, the story of Emmaus, takes place on Easter Sunday. That morning, they found the tomb to be empty. And think of the week that the disciples had had. Just seven days earlier, Jesus and his followers were welcomed into the holiest city of Israel, Jerusalem, with crowds waving branches in the air, screaming, Hosanna in the highest. And in four days, it all falls apart. They are betrayed by one of their own. Jesus is arrested and beaten and put on trial and executed. The disciples have every reason to be afraid, just like you and I have our reasons to be afraid today. They were associated with a man who had been considered to be dangerous, blasphemous, and illegal. So what do we find in today's gospel? Two disciples, Cleopas and one disciple who's unnamed, walking to the town of Emmaus about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. While the other disciples are up in the room hiding, these two are running away. I have to admit, this is one of my most favorite gospel stories in the entire Bible. I love what the gospel writer Luke has done with this, because it's not just a story. There's a, the way he tells it, there's a lesson, a lesson in four movements or four stages. First, we have the disciples walking to Emmaus. Jesus joins them and they're kept from seeing who he is, and he approaches them and says, hey, what are you two talking about? They stop in their tracks and basically say, what do you live under a rock? Where have you been? Don't you know what's been going on in Jerusalem? The whole city is talking about how this person, Jesus, was supposed to be a Messiah. And he says to them, well, well what things? And he gets them to tell him his story. He gets his followers to tell the Jesus story. The irony is rich here. And in their telling, they say this, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. In essence, he comes to them in their fear, just as he had come to the disciples in their fear behind the locked door, and asks, how are you doing? And they say, we are exhausted, we are afraid, we're confused and dejected. The second stage in the story is him correcting their telling of the story. Oh, how foolish you are, how silly you are, he says. How slow to believe. Then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted for them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. It's, as a professor, it's like an oral exam. 
tell me about Jesus, says Jesus. And then his followers, Cleopas and his disciple, tell the Jesus story as best they can. And in their telling of the story, he corrects it and, and fixes what they don't understand. Stage three, they get to Emmaus. He's acting like he's going to keep walking on. They invite him to come and sit with them and, ha and have dinner. As that they're sitting at the table, he breaks, just as he had broken open the scriptures, he breaks open the bread, just like at the Last Supper. Their eyes are opened. They see the stranger for who he really is, and he disappears. And they say to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us? They immediately get up and run back to Jerusalem. And that's the last stage. They arrive with the other disciples and tell them what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And so Luke, who's a masterful storyteller, has the story come full circle. They are now telling the Jesus story to their own friends. He makes them tell the story, his story, to himself, corrects it, breaks open the bread, sends them back to Jerusalem where they tell the story presumably better. They have become evangelists. The lesson for us today is clear. We are exhausted, afraid, disoriented, adrift, and empty. Just like the disciples when all of their hopes and dreams were dashed in a matter of days. These imperfect followers of Christ, some who are hiding, some are running away. In these imperfect followers of Jesus, we find companions in our own fear and despair. And the promise of Christ is the same for us as it was for them. I am with you. I will come to you behind your locked door. I will meet you on the road while you try to run away. But that's not the only part of the story. It's not a just, I am there with you in your moment of pain. There's a sending forth in this gospel as well, just as there was last week. As the Father sent me, so I send you, is what we heard last week. And in this story, he sends those two back to Jerusalem, back to those who are paralyzed in fear. He sends them with a message of hope. My friends, in this time when we are all really tried and stressed and afraid and losing hope, it's very easy to give in to that, to take in the negative message, to play that tape over and over again in our head. But that is not what Christians are called to do. In our broken, bleeding, suffering world, we, you and I, the people I am talking to right now, we are not permitted to give in to despair. We are disciples of Christ. Each and every one of us is an evangelist. We are messengers of hope and life in a world wrought with despair, fear, sickness, and death. Our world is too suffering, suffering too much for us to cave into despair and give up hope. We are to be light in dark places. And so I'm going to leave you today with the same challenge we had last week. I ask you, commit yourself to one act of kindness, one act of hope, one act of solidarity each and every day this week. Our world needs it. I'm not talking about raising millions of dollars. Rather, just as in Lent we committed to prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, I ask you to give yourself, commit yourself in this season of Easter to calling someone who's alone every day or forgiving the selfishness of others because we're all stressed every day. Be patient with your family and your neighbors. Be generous to those who have lost their jobs. Offer a kind ear and a warm smile. Just look every day for one place where you can bring hope and healing to one person as our world suffers through this pandemic. That's what it means to be a disciple in dark times, in this Easter tide. Our world is broken and afraid. 
and we have a message of hope and light. Welcome, my friends, to week seven of the pandemic quarantine. Welcome to the third week of Easter. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Uh, we come to that point in our service where we lift up the needs of the world, locally and globally. Our thoughts and prayers, Lord, must first go to those who are dying. Bring comfort to those who are facing death. Show them mercy and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick. If it is your will, give them strength, give them companionship in this difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all healthcare workers, for doctors and nurses and aides and everybody who cleans and works in our healthcare system. Give them strength to face this daunting task. Let them know that while they might labor alone, that we are praying for them. Let our prayers give them strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are struggling economically, the unemployed, the underemployed, small business owners, people who've lost their jobs and sources of income. Help us to see their need, and for those of us who are able, help us to be more generous. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all civic leaders. Help them to have wisdom and compassion in this time of challenge. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whose lives are complicated by this coronavirus and this pandemic, for those who struggle with mental illness, for those who are separated from family and friends, for those who are alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I'd like to end today's service with a quote from a spiritual writer, Henri Nouwen. Um, he wrote a fantastic book called With Burning Hearts, which is a reflection actually on the Emmaus story. This quote um, does not come from that book, but it's a quote from Henri Nouwen. Um, if you're looking for something to read, if you like this story, I, I highly recommend his book, With Burning Hearts. And this will be our closing prayer and benediction. Compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion means full immersion in the condition of being human. We thank you, Lord, for making us human, for fashioning us in your image and likeness. The cost of being human is that we are fragile. Christ knew what fragility meant. He shared with us the fate of all humankind, death, and he opened for us the fate of all humankind, resurrection and eternal life. May Almighty God be good to you this week. May Almighty God help you to be good to others. And may Almighty God bless us all. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Have a great week.